welcome everyone to the JavaScript uh, Developer Days. In uh, today's session, we're going to present and walk you through our OpenAI JavaScript sample um, with our special guest, Lars, with us here. Hey. Hi, Lars. Welcome, oh, Lars. thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Lars Brink from Denmark. I'm a Microsoft MVP for several years in developer technologies, GitHub star for several years. Uh, recently, NX champion, NX the, the build framework, open source, uh, and also Angular Hero of Education for writing a book on Angular. And I help organize communities um, both virtually and in person. That's amazing. You also have uh, uh, this this amazing community for for education. This is learning. This this is learning, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the show I, is, this is I, I was thinking this is Angular, this is Angular, but I, you, there is another one. This is Angular, right? Or this yeah, is, that's, yeah, that's our sub brand. It's part of this is learning because okay. a lot of us have Angular backgrounds. At least that's how it started. Today, the this is learning part is even bigger than this is Angular, but still, we have so much Angular content that it makes sense to have a separate uh, sub brand for that. So this is a community I founded with Santos Yada three years ago, and it's grown to about 100 contributors, all kinds of public tech contributors like tech writers and uh, content creators, open source maintainers, speakers and writers and authors and everything in between. And we accept uh, contributors from all skill levels, which I think is great as well. So we support us, uh, each other in this community and offer free public channels to promote your, your content and improve as a, a contributor. We also have Wasim. Wasim, introduce yourself too. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's me. Um, I, I work at Microsoft as a senior developer advocate engineer uh, with a focus on JavaScript. And uh, yeah, I have a background in, in mostly in JavaScript. <laughs> I've been doing JavaScript since, since 2004 ish, before jQuery. And, uh, and yeah, Angular since 2009 with AngularJS and then Angular. B2, uh, and this is where yeah, I get to know Lars and also met Natalia, by the way, uh, before we <laughs> get to work at Microsoft as colleagues, we yeah, were hanging out in conferences all over the world, Angular conferences. Mostly. Yeah, and I'm Natalia Bendito, and I'm a principal product manager at Microsoft, and I lead uh, the developer experience on Azure end-to-end -end for JavaScript. Uh, across the many services and, and also developer tools. And I collaborate very closely with Wasim from content to, to actually designing and implementing developer tools and experiences. This sample that we're going to be talking about is one of those experiences that we have designed and put together so the, the Azure community and the JavaScript community can better understand how to implement this type of applications with best practices in mind and how each building block works in integration. So welcome everyone again. If you want to follow along, you can check out the repo, you can clone it, github.com slash Azure dash samples slash Azure dash search dash OpenAI dash JavaScript. And we have the JavaScript uh, suffix because we have this exact same application in different languages, C Sharp, Python, and Java. We can now start talking about the retrieval augment generation that is part of this architecture sample or, or the pattern that powers it. Lars, have you heard about RAG before? Yeah, I have heard about it. And uh, I was so lucky to be part of uh, AI bootcamp through the Microsoft MVP program. But to be honest, I forgot uh, about it since, since I haven't been using it. So hopefully you can help explain it to me again. Some, some call it pattern, some call it technique. But when we are working with um, generative AI, what's happening is uh, the, the model, what it does is it gives the system the ability to predict what is the uh, next word that fits in a sentence. So how does it do that? Well, it, it has access to a very large, what they call corpus of data. And then it ingests all that information. And with all that information, passed as parameters to a large language model. Um, it can then decide word by word as a token what is going to be responding, how it's going to be constructing a response to a question. And basically, this technique is designed to work with those very, very large language models that have parameters in the, I think it's in the millions right now for the latest versions of the the GPT model. We're talking about massive operations, compute operations that are taking place in a very, very short amount of time. And this is why we have to continuously 
uh, refine these techniques in order to make better predictions, better content. I think Copilot's been the, the most um, popular use case that developers are interested in these days. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been an early um, access uh, member of, of GitHub Copilot uh, for, for years, and it's it's a great part of my everyday as a developer. I wouldn't uh, work without it. Um, Microsoft Copilot, I'm very excited about that as well with the ability to make these custom GPTs or custom Copilots and see how that can be integrated as part of uh, business use cases. I think that's very interesting, and that was primarily what I was learning in these Microsoft AI boot camps. And then you... The more you learn, the more you realize that you have to learn even more to get the full picture, right? Absolutely. So you have to learn about prompt engineering and, and agency and uh, the open AI protocols and, and all of that goodness. Let's walk through the architecture of this particular sample. Uh, yeah, let me let me give you a high overview of the, the architecture that we uh, designed. This uh, sample application was basically built on top of different services, Azure services, I mean by that. So the, one of them is Azure Static Web Apps. Obviously, this, we use that to deploy our uh, front-end application, the, the UI of the, the RAG chat application. The bigger part is the, the backend, which uses multiple Azure components and Azure services. One of them is Azure Container Apps. So this is where we deploy both the um, indexer, which we're going to talk about later, and also the search. API. And yeah, we leverage Azure Container App plus all the registry mechanism uh, in order to deploy the um, business logic of the indexer and the search. Uh, we also use Azure uh, AI search for uh, accessing the uh, the embeddings and the, uh, the vectors. And we also um, use, obviously, OpenAI as our like main <laughs> API for uh, retrieving the models and uh, the predictions and everything. Uh, something which is not shown here, we also use uh, different libraries uh, li like LangChain.js, for instance, uh, which help us interact with Azure OpenAI, uh, which itself interacts with OpenAI. This is like the, yeah, the, the high level. Uh, we are gonna go into more details into the code uh, in the next uh, uh, slides. But basically, this is the architecture that you get when you deploy uh, the sample using uh, AZD. We also have some like optional uh, services like the um, monitoring of logs and and um, and system logs. Uh. Now, let's actually see code, right? So the actual sample uh, repo is built on top of, uh, on top of npm uh, workspaces as a monorepo, and um, under each packages, obviously we have the different uh, components uh, we mentioned earlier. The Two that I'm gonna present right now are the indexer and next the search. This is basically these are basically the two core components for our backends. So the indexer is what allows us to uh, ingest the data and index it. <laughs> uh, we and by the way we are to serve these two components as in the REST API we're uh, using uh, Fastify. The actual meat is is in this is in this file uh, which is responsible of Processing all the um, files that we support. For now, we support uh, Markdown and text and PDFs. We uh, read the whole text, the whole uh, chunks of text, and then we try to um, split them into smaller chunks. So then we can easily index them, uh, upload them to the uh, to Azure. In order to uh, split those texts, basically, I'm going to highlight this uh, whole method, which called uh, split page. So what we do, what we do here basically is we leverage the um, sliding window algorithm in order to uh, split the, um, the sections of the whole text, but in a like a clever manner. I mean, <laughs> because we want to split the text um, while we keep the context, because this is where we we're going to basically run the search in the in the next um, phase. Basically, making sure that we split the text. Uh, according to like sentences, or in some cases, uh, whole words. We're not, we don't want to. We don't want to basically split in the middle of a, of a word or in the middle of a sentence because we're going to lose context. And yeah, once these, once we construct these document section, we use them and upload them to uh, Azure Storage, uh, so then they could be uh, used as as indexes for uh, for the search. So, and uh, this document processing uh, mechanism is basically used in, in this in this indexer file, 
where we uh, grab those uh, sections that we constructed uh, using our algorithm and then upload them uh, to our Azure um, search uh, in the index. Yeah, and then we expose the service, as I mentioned, as a um, uh, using Fastify as, as a plugin. We have like a bunch of plugins, by the way, but uh, the index are exposed in this manner. Most of the um, endpoints we expose are using the same pattern. We, doc we decorate using Fastify indexer in this case and expose it as an endpoint. And it's like a really fantastic way to expose API. So I'm really glad we, we went with Fastify. Paris, do you have any questions on the indexer? Yeah, from what I understand, it's processing different documents to, to make them available for end users to search uh, via this, this chat client. Yeah, we use a local uh, ingestion mechanism using this CLI. Uh, you give it like a, a folder basically a folder called data where you put all your files and by the way we are using this uh, sample application as a in, in the context of this other control so real estate application that we've built so basically all the all the knowledge that we are feeding this rag is basically based on this control so real estate application so we're giving it terms of services guidelines how to start with this and that and these are being fed at, as markdown files that the indexer through the CLI is uploading to Azure. And then we are we are exposing this also as a as an endpoint. So the search uh, similarly is a different package uh, under, uh, yeah, under the packages where a workspace. And um, the search API follows the same again, <laughs> the same um, pattern is exposed using Fastify. Uh, as an endpoint and being registered through the same mechanism. Basically, uh, the search that we uh, that we provide uh, is using like standard search mechanism in this RAG experiences. Um, they called approaches and you will see them registered here as basically we support two approaches or like two techniques. I'll call them techniques, which are um, read retrieval read, I think. That's the first one. And then the other one is uh, read then, uh, retrieve then read. Um, and we also support two, on top of those searches, we support two, um, two search experiences. One is called, we call chat, and the other one is called ask. So a chat, basically, it's a, it's a stream of discussions, you know, like you're a thread with you and the system assistant. With the user and the system assistant, the ask it's it's like a one one shot question, and then you get the response. We have some explanation for each um, approach. In, in in its core, you you would probably wouldn't be concerned about which approach you use, uh, but because basically they give you they will give you an answer. Uh, however, we do support both approaches in our samples. The search experience we offer is based on these two approach and. As I mentioned in the introduction, we use this library called Langchain, uh, the JavaScript implementation of Langchain, to uh, basically uh, uh, access and retrieve all the models or, or like communicate between our search, our API, and OpenAI, which makes it really easier to uh, to get the model and get uh, compute all the uh, fonts. Yeah, we have a few examples here how we can respond and construct the results uh, back to the user. Yeah, Wasim mentioned Langchain and uh... You might have heard also about semantic kernel from Microsoft. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no JavaScript SDK for that yet. So yes. Langchain is definitely your best option there. Yes. And yeah. And, yeah and by the way, uh, speaking about Langchain, I just want to give a huge shout out to Johan, who did a tremendous work contributing to uh, Langchain.js upstream repo, yeah. adding, adding nice. support for uh, tons of uh, Azure services. Uh, so yeah, kudos to, to him. This is one of the objectives when we put together these samples is to understand what gaps may exist between our services and some popular JavaScript libraries. And in this case, Langchain is one of the most popular um, libraries for implementation of this type of applications in the JavaScript community. And we always want to contribute back to the ecosystem. So yes, definitely great uh, work from, from Johan make making sure that we can work with uh, Langchain and also the Azure uh, OpenAI SDK for JavaScript in this case. And I also want to highlight, I mean, um, add, if you're if you happen to use Java as a backend, um, uh, another colleague of us, Julian Dubois, has added support for Langchain for Java for J. I don't know how they call it. 
Um, yeah, so if you're using Azure and using that popular library for Java, there, there, there's also support for, uh, for that. We have created at Microsoft this specification called the HTTP protocol for AI chat applications. What we try to do with this is to create a unified API shape so we can say, this is how these requests and responses and any error associated or any success to, to hitting these APIs should look like. And that allows us to swap frontends and backends in a seamless way. So I know if I am building a frontend application that is going to connect to a service um, implementing the rack pattern in this case, that when I am creating my frontend service or my client side service and I need to write a request, I have to format it in a specific way, pass some specific headers and make it a specific uh, type of request. In this case, it's always a post request because it takes some payload to the um, backend service to then deliver the response. And that makes it possible to work with different backends and different uh, frontend applications is a contract, right? Between frontend or backend or between different services? This is between frontend and backend in this case. Mm. So this is adding extra context for the for the front end to, yeah. to allow it to display more uh, more information. Let's see the application. Let's see the application working. I have it locally and I have it also already deployed. Let's go with the local. So we were mentioning before that this was built for the use case of our rentals portal. And so as you can see, there is a set of default questions here in the application, how, how to search and book rentals or what is the refund policy? Let's go with the first one. We, we could, of course, write our own, right? But let's let's use one of the default ones. Yeah, and that there, there is this, this response being, being put together with citations, which are these um, little tokens here that will take you directly to the source of the response. So the document, where the system got this response from. Uh, if I click here, it's going to be loading this preview. This is the document where I got my response. And in this case, as you can see, there, there are PDF documents and there are also markdown documents that are ingested by the same service, like uh, was mentioned earlier. And we can also make some follow-up questions. Okay, now you ask about uh, how to search and book rentals, maybe you also want to understand what are the guest verification requirements. Just click and go. Because we are, again, uh, like, like Wasim explained, we have the ask and we have the chat um, modes for the application. In this case, is is a chat, so it keeps the context of the whole conversation. This is how the, the application works, in essence, on the front-end side. But we were also mentioning the settings that we can pass. We saw the overrides when we were seeing the, the chat protocol specification that could be passed as a template here. This is not for the end user. This is because we want to showcase how developers could potentially pass overrides from a, an application settings uh, dashboard that is restricted, obviously, to the business and not to the end user. But if we wanted to a little bit tweak how the response arrives to us. We can then pass these overrides. We can also adjust the retrieval mode directly from the settings. Then we can also exclude certain categories. We can adjust the relevance with the semantic ranker, with the query contextual summaries instead of whole documents. So it, the, the system will first generate a summary and then use this summary to elaborate the response. The suggestion of follow-up questions that we saw can be enabled or disabled. And also we can um, stream or not the response. I would like Wasim to explain streaming because he is the one who implemented this very, very nice effect of typing. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first, first of all, I just want to uh, mention something. So for people who are watching the show, if you are use, if you want to use the sample app and deploy it to production, well, first of all, please run some security audits uh, before you deploy to production. And second, secondly, you need to disable the app settings and not. Ah, yeah, it. definitely. 
to play with that with those. So yeah, disable them and hard code the values if you can. Like yeah, that, that's my warning. Um, yeah, the, at the end of the day, we are we are just getting the response from from OpenAI, oh, Azure OpenAI, and then OpenAI, and we get those as chunks like streams coming coming from the from the backend. So we are passing along through Fastify through our REST API those streams to the front end. Um, and yeah, basically uh, on the front end side, and that the logic you can find inside of the web component implementation, we are taking those chunks coming up from the from the back end and then parsing them live <laughs> on the fly because the UI you're seeing here is basically being rendered on the fly uh, as we get data from the back end. So all the citations, all the CSS uh, that are applied, CSS classes, and uh, the elements are, well, they're built with lates again, we're gonna mention that afterwards. But yeah, um, these are be being parsed at sometimes it's fail, as you can see, uh, depending on the response from the server. So basically, yeah, go in trying to find some placeholders and some um, special characters in the response in order for us to construct a meaningful UI for the end user. Uh, and also this is open source, that's the, Opportunity for me to mention, we are welcome all contributions if you want to improve this uh, parsing uh, algorithm. And believe me, uh, parsing streams are really, really hard <laughs> because you need to make a lot of decisions because like you're parsing data as it comes in. So yeah, uh, there are some techniques. So yeah, if you uh, if you want to help uh, or contribute, please feel free. But basically, yeah, that's the, the simple approach to it. Uh, and yeah, if you disable the streaming as Natalia mentioned, then that's easy for us because we are getting the whole piece of text and then we can easily parse it and render it correctly without any uh, errors. Yeah. But it takes up. long. It it takes longer, right? So I I just disable streaming and yeah. it comes in a full chunk, but it takes longer and it is not as much fun. Yeah, why we decided to write this application with web components because we wanted to create as many samples as possible and also make sure that any customer using a modern front-end application or whatever, if they're using a framework, if they're using plain JavaScript, they could just integrate this chat application to their own existing app uh, and, and make sure it worked without having to, to install um, a very large dependency. Applications that we have created so far with React, with Next.js, with Angular, um, have not offered a lot of difficulty in integration. Uh, so I, I think that, that it was a good decision in the end. So if people want to build like other application with, with Vue or whatever framework, please feel free to do it. Like we're happy to get your PRs. <laughs> Absolutely. We want to have as many frameworks and, and samples as, as possible. So if you're using one framework that is not in our list, we're very happy to have your contribution. And we have invited Lars to share with us what are these new capabilities that this framework is offering today that didn't have in earlier or previous version. Okay. Yeah. So as you said, Natalia, uh, lots of lots of lots of new features and changes are coming and have already been released as part of Angular. Um, a lot of exciting things uh, related to especially signals, uh, which is inspired by features from other frameworks like SolidJS that has signals, but almost every framework either has signal or something like it or is looking to implement it. Angular.dev is, is part of the new things being uh, released. Uh, it's a new documentation and learning website for Angular. There's this new logo for Angular. So if you've seen this A with the gradient uh, background, that's the new Angular logo. Uh, it's using the Google, uh, what's it called, IDX or something like that, this uh, embedded development environment, uh, similar to Stackbridge or something like that. So it's it's using that inside of this documentation to really make it an interactive experience to be learning about Angular. And there, like we see here, there's guides on signals, the fundamentals of that. There's the API reference is also part of Angular.dev. So you can find all the information you need, uh, both about new and, and old older existing features of Angular. So signals is this reactive primitive. So it's a way of, of managing granular pieces of state. And the Angular story, the Angular epic of signals is, is a long one. There's many, many different features that are going to be released related to signals. Signals are already 
most of signals in Angular, the, the, the single primi uh, the primitive signal itself is already here, but related things like the effect is still experimental. So some changes are still needed before that's finalized. Uh, so that's the effect function related to signals reacting to changes in signals data um, data values. Uh, another feature that I'm looking forward to is uh, signal based components, which will make change detection in Angular more efficient. And even if you're not going to migrate to signal components, there's also coming official zoneless uh, uh, zoneless components or zoneless Angular applications, an official solution for writing zoneless applications without migrating all your components to signal-based components. So there's a bunch of really, really important changes coming to Angular. Uh, more related to signals is signal-based forms. We're going to need those because Angular Forms is a really important library. There, well, there's two APIs, and we need official solutions for how to integrate Angular signals with that. Uh, uh, so that, that's also something that's not here yet, but it's going to be a, a major uh, benefit. Uh, something else? No, I think that's about the, the roadmap of, of signals. So signals, the, the values, the data containers, signals, they are already here. The related effect function is something that's being worked on finalizing right now. It is, you can import it, but it's in developer preview, so it should be ready for changes to occur in, in any ver new release of Angular. Um, other important features that are not related to signals uh, is this new uh, template syntax. So historically, Angular versions 2 through uh, 16 have been more HTML-like with some special uh, symbols like the, the square brackets uh, property bindings and uh, the parentheses event binding and so on. And now uh, some of the most used directives of Angular like ngif and ng4 have been turned into this new uh, syntax. So it's part of a template syntax rather than being these structural directive extensions to Angular itself. So now you might see in a template the at sign, so an at if, at sign like in an email address, right? So at if and at for, for a for loop, where before you would use ng if with the star in front and uh, ng4 with the star in front for structural directive. So yeah, here's the sample for the for loop. Now it looks like this. Uh, another important change here is the track, the track keyword. Before the track by function was optional in the ng4 directive, but now it's required. So you always have to track by some value in the, uh, the, the items you are iterating over in this for loop because of performance reasons. Uh, so it forces you to think about, uh, it's it's similar to React where you have the, the key uh, identifier. So here it's track in the new Angular template syntax, and you can track by any property on the object or the object itself, or the index value uh, as it's iterating through the for loop, for example, what, whatever makes the most sense to your use case. So those are some of the more interesting features for and if the new syntax is already stable and part of Angular 17. There's another very, very important one coming. It's the def defer uh, keyword. So it's part of the feature called deferrable views. Um, I think it's in developer preview in version 17 that we're on. Uh, so if we try to look for this defer keyword at defer, there's definitely the documentation, and I think we would be able to use it in Angular 17 as well, but it's in developer preview, so be, be a little cautious, expect changes. This is so powerful. What could be a, a good use case for signals in the context of an application like the RAG chat GPT? So in our sample, uh, well, yes. should we go look at the code? To the code. Then you can follow me, because right now in this branch, we have just this uh, one, so use live share, follow me, yes. Uh, live share, by the way, is a, an extension for VS Code by Microsoft, where we can follow each other and we can modify the code in real time together. So really a nice tool and it's easy to set up. Uh, so now you should be able to see me where my cursor is at, the file I have open. So mm -hmm. this is the this is the settings component that we saw, the developer settings uh, that we saw in the, the UI when that was loaded. Uh, so this is the only Angular component. It's uh, also a new feature relatively new standalone component, meaning that all the imports are here in the component decorator options rather than in an Angular module. And some of these are still modules, and mostly the Angular material ones. Uh, 
in the latest release or a soon to come release, I think uh, the, the modern Angular material components will also be available as standalone components. So we're not importing modules with many components. That's very good. Very good news. So, so here uh, we see an example of not a standalone component, but a standalone pipe, the async pipe. Uh, previously, the only option was to import this common module, which brings in a lot of stuff. And previously also the ng4 and ngf directives that they are still here, but we could also use the, the this new syntax uh, for a period of time. The settings component, here's the template. So down here, we see that we are using this custom element, the chat component that we saw was implemented using lit. And uh, the, this, I see that this API uh, of the component is has uh, there's there's a property title, and then there's attributes. So this is the the attribute binding syntax in Angular. So there's data dash attributes for the other inputs. Uh, but apparently title is the property. So that's something you could access in the DOM element uh, object of this uh, chat component uh, from what I see here in the template. So here we are passing the the different properties, but I'm not sure any of these are actually dynamic or whether they are static. Uh, they're not assigned yeah. elsewhere, are they? Or are they, maybe they are in, yeah, they're probably they're... here. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so the, the, the streaming uh, setting, whether it's uh, we should be streaming the output as we saw earlier, or getting the full chunk, waiting for that uh, before rendering the response to the user. This is a Boolean property. It's set to true by default. And uh, here it's passed to the chat component custom element, but we also see it being bound here using Angular template driven forms, the ng model directive and the Angular material checkbox component. So th this is actually an example of uh, what, what could be great to, to have as a signal because signals are about granular values. So uh, what, I, what I've mentioned, uh, uh, offline prior to this uh, is that a property like this settings default is not a good candidate for signals since it's an object with many different properties. So ideally we would split these into individual properties that are or rather signals. Each property would be a signal. And I even see here that this settings default has the streaming property, right? Uh, so so maybe that's uh, maybe we should even be, be using this as the default property down here or something. Uh, so, so this streaming property, which is just a Boolean uh, value contained in a property, uh, this could be a signal, but we could try modifying that to a signal. And uh, I'm going to import here from Angular Core, the signal. And here we go. Uh, oh, I'm just remembering a new, relatively new feature is you can have input properties as signals as well. But we don't have any input properties in this component, but that's something that's, that already landed as far as I remember in, in latest versions of Angular. Is, is that correct uh, from what you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think yes. Yeah. There was uh, a lot of a lot of celebration about it, I've seen. Input symbol yeah. signals would be a good candidate if we have written the chat component in Angular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that right should even be available the, here. Because right now what takes the input is the uh, dynamic property in the chat, um, yeah, in the lead component. So this is why we are not using outputs and inputs in Angular. Okay. So now, now that this is a, a signal uh, that contains the initial value of true, meaning that we see here that the, the type parameter or that the actual type here is a writable signal containing a Boolean value. And with signals, we always have to have an initial value. Uh, there's no late value. We have to have that first value initially. And we already had that the default value of truth. So let's, it makes sense to keep that. So now to let's first uh, go into where we pass it to our chat component, web component uh, to pass the value we will call it as a function. This is how we get the value of a signal. And Angular's template will then uh, be aware of when this, uh, this signal changes. It has to re-render 
this part of the template. So it'll, it'll pass this attribute to our chat component custom element. So this is passing the data along. Now we're missing what, uh, what about updating the signal? And uh, this is where we're, we're using the ng model uh, template driven uh, forms to have like easy data two way like data binding. And uh, but but now we have to <laughs> change this banana in a box syntax, uh, which is the, the special Angular syntax for actually two bindings, which is uh, ng model change, change. Oh. sorry, and uh, ng model the, the property binding. So here, uh, I, I guess that we would uh, here would be passing the value. So so unpack unwrapping the value, the boolean value of this uh, streaming signal. That's the property binding part. The event binding part is when the form control, so the user uh, or rather the checkbox, the angle materials checkbox emits a new value. Uh, we will get the uh, value here as the event, the special event value. So we pass that to the streaming. Uh, signal and we used a set method, sorry, a set method here. So this is what I think is needed to to make this work. Um, so let's. Wanted to wrap the. I don't know why it's not showing me. Okay, let's let's just go ahead. And of course, in the future, there will be a more an easier way of integrating uh, Angular forms with signals, rather you're, whether you're do, using the template-driven forms or the um, reactive forms, because signals and observables they 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 are more yeah, they they make sense to use together. And even Angular has some uh, mapping functions to map an observable to a signal and to map a signal to an observable yeah. for for interoperability. And the the reactive Angular forms already has observables. So, so we even if we were using that, we could also uh, concern, uh, co convert, for example, the value changes observable to a signal uh, using the Angular RxJS interrupt package, I think. So Lars, I have a question for you. Um, do you recommend using signals with primitive values like numbers, booleans, or uh, or um, we can use them with any like, Random mm -hmm. layer, like text or strings or arrays or objects. Yeah. So if we were to wrap a, a like a, an object or data structure, like uh, the data overrides and the settings defaults, uh, the the issue here is that uh, I mean it wouldn't be an issue to wrap this in a signal. In in the longer term, uh, signals are part of optimizing change detection, as I mentioned a bit earlier especially when signal-based components will be part of uh, Angular in, in the coming year or two or something like that, I, I imagine. As, and in, at that, that point, it's it's important to have these granular uh, values so that rather than having the whole object as one signal, you have each each primitive value, as you say, each, each string and each Boolean, similar to what we did with the streaming signal, that it's a Boolean value. It's not an object with a property with a Boolean value. The reason for that is, uh, so now, um, if this was a signal, so so-called signal component that will be available in the future, then Angular would would know only to re-render this uh, this part of the template uh, once once this one sig once the streaming signal value changes. If this was if if uh, streaming was part of a, an entire uh, object, like if we have settings um uh or it's, it's over here instead if we had a settings primitive with an object that had a streaming property then this part of the template that this checkbox would be re-rendered every time any property of the settings object was changing so now it's not very granular anymore now it's not much better than just re-rendering the entire component uh which has been kind of the, the default uh Way of change detection when you're looking at a single component, but with with signal-based component, we should be seeing local change detection where parts of the template can be rendered based on uh, like granular signal values. So it's another thing to to think of in this new world of of signals. And uh, I think what what I suggested uh, when when we discussed this is, uh, I mean, there there are 
great libraries in the Angular ecosystem, open source libraries by the community, and we're already seeing signals being integrated into them. For example, if you're using NGRX store, you can get an observable uh, selector as a signal, uh, but there's also this entirely new package called the uh, NGRX signals, where there's the signal store, where everything is signals. And that is great when you have a lot of data, like, like an, a big complex data structure. Well, it's not that complex, but even if you have nested data structures, uh, you can still get each signal uh, value or each, each property of this object as its own signal without having to uh, create all these signals manually. If I were to create uh, every one of these properties, it would be what 12 signals or, or something like that. So I will have an easier time with something like the NGRX signal store or the Arch Angular state, uh, the new functional APIs that also have the signal support. So, but here we are trying to get uh, keep the dependencies to a minimum, and by that only having Angular. And we just saw that we can. It makes sense to have a signal here, if uh, which will allow us to have better change detection in the future when signal components arrive, or even if we turn this application into what's called the zoneless application, where NG zone is disabled, which can have major performance benefits. How do we get this on Azure? Yeah, that that sometimes is not is not trivial, especially for front end developers, understanding what are the the resources that we need to provision in Azure. How do we go about deploying all these parts, and then putting them back together in a way that everything works? What we wanted to provide is a template in this case to use with uh, Azure Developer CLI. That's our provisioning deployment tool in this case, our deployment engine. And if you look at the repo over here, you'll see that we have all these bicep files. Bicep is a domain specific language used to, to describe all these, um, all these infrastructure that we want to provision, to pass secrets, to um, configure, for example, here, if we go to the Azure Static Web Apps where this Angular application will be deployed to, we can see that we are defining a resource that is going to be using this, um, this specific API to pass a name, a location, the tags, the, the SKU or the, the tier where this application is going to be deployed to, and uh, a set of properties in this case. Yeah, we're going to be doing this with the SWA CLI. Right, we're going to, to to perform this provision and deployment using this tool as part of the Azure Developer CLI. Because we already have all these definitions here, we can do this with one single command. Actually, we should be um we should be logged in to Azure and to the Azure Developer CLI. That's typically done with um, ACD house login and that will take you to complete a flow or prompt you to 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 log in and then you can go back and just run ACD app and follow the the prompt that will start appearing in your terminal and it should be it should be deployed and we're not going to go through the whole deployment because our provision and deployment because Particularly provisioning takes around 12 minutes in this case, but we're going to go to the to the portal where we already have a deployment. And we can see those are the resources that are going to be deployed, the search uh, service in a, um, Azure Container Apps, the indexer, then there are some other additional resources that make this work, like the container registry. It's not something that that you need to, to worry about. It's going to be provisioned for you. The Azure OpenAI service, um, it requires that you have Azure OpenAI credentials, of course. And finally, the static web app over here. And if we go to, to this resource and we click on the URL, we are on the Angular application over here that functional. So Azure Developer CLI ACD app is the command. And this is a template that it's already part of the Azure Awesome ACD, sorry, gallery where you can go and find all kinds of templates, including JavaScript templates, uh, to get started quickly on Azure with JavaScript. Thank you, Lars, for being with us, for teaching us about signals Thank you, and about Angular.
Thank you, I, I love talking about Angular and Azure and AI. So thank you for inviting me. We will always have you on board whenever we have that combo because you are the right person to, to chat about these things.